Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus. My name is Trace. This is a podcast style show where we take one big topic and we break it up over a whole series so that everybody, including myself, can understand it a little bit better. And this week we're talking about a pretty huge topic, the internet. We want to know what it is, how it works, where it lives, and what people have used it for, both good and bad. But first, what exactly is the internet and how does it work? Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska famously described it as a series of tubes, which isn't entirely wrong, but that's not even close to being right. The internet is an interconnected network, internet, of computers. Servers or hosts store the websites and they provide data to the clients, which is you guys. In 1969, there were four host computers and only a few nodes, which we'll explain what those are in a second. Now, today, millions of computers host websites all over the world with nodes spread across our planet and even in space. They have access to the internet on the International Space Station. It's so cool. One third of the world's seven billion people use the internet. Many of them use it every single day. The hosts, which are the computers that serve the websites, are controlled by individuals, by companies, by governments, and that's why no single entity really controls the entire internet. Nobody owns the internet, which makes it very difficult to regulate and control as a whole. But how does that work? So let's walk through some data from the computer all the way to the server and back again. To connect from your computer requires a lot of steps. And the first is a modem, even though it's not the AOL do 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 kind of modem. This is any computer, even today, has a modem. It's just connected to your Wi Fi card now. Your modem is your first node, and it has its own IP address or internet protocol address, and it's connected via your cable or DSL lines to connect to another modem at your internet service provider. So when you connect, you're connecting to them. The ISP has local connection points, which are kind of like highway on ramps, and they are usually windowless climate controlled buildings called a point of presence or a pop. They're all over buildings all over the world. And sometimes you'll see them while walking around. If you start noticing them, you will start to see them everywhere. They usually say an ISP's name on the front, like Verizon or AT&T, and they just have no windows and are these huge buildings. It's really cool. The ISP modems are then networked together with fiber optic cable to a network access point in a larger city. It's a NAP in a larger city for your region. So that would be another node. Then in major cities, The biggest ISPs like Comcast and Time Warner and AT&T and Verizon come together connecting their NAPs, their network access points, making the network even bigger. And finally, major cities are then connected using giant bundles of fiber optic cable in more giant windowless buildings all over the place, allowing petabytes of data to stream through. Then you get the internet backbone, which is awesome. In 1987, the National Science Foundation created the very first high-speed internet backbone, which allows 170 different networks to connect. That was in 1987. Today, high-capacity backbones connect to networks across the globe. These trunk cables are literally like, like, like sailed ships with big spools of cable, and then they just dropped it off the back of the ship, and it lays on the ocean floor off the coasts of countries, and that's where the internet goes. So when you dial on your computer, say you live in Africa somewhere, if you want to go to our website, testtube.com, you will end up taking a packet of data, sending it to your ISP, sending it over the backbone all the way here, and then back to your computer again. So how that works is, say you type in testtube.com into your browser. That text is translated into a packet of data. It's just called a packet. And it could be instructions, a request. It could be authorization codes, encrypted messages. Then the packets are sent to your internet service provider, like AT&T or something, and they are routed through the network to get from your computer to the ISP through the cables around your neighborhood. They want to go as fast as possible. They can also go through cell towers, but eventually they'll get to cables. Think of the packets as a group of cars on a highway. Sometimes it's faster to go in a line, and sometimes it's faster to take different routes, like I don't know, you could also think of it as people on water slides, right? (laughs) But sometimes there's that one spot where all the water slides start and they always end in the same pool, but they'll take different paths to get there. That's called packet switching. And it was invented in 1965 as a way to combat potential attacks on the computer system by the Soviets. They wanted to make sure that the data would get where it's going and it can use a variety of different paths to get there. If my computer uses hundreds of packets 
to upload a video to testtube.com, for example, then each packet's path is going to be assessed as they show up at the ISP, and they're going to take the fastest route possible to get where they're going. Once I've typed testtube.com, though, the ISP takes that information and goes to a domain name server, connecting through another series of tubes, and to find out what testtube.com translates to in terms of an IP address, that four perioded number that you see sometimes. Google is huge, so they have lots of IP addresses, many hundreds of IP addresses. The domain name server, or DNS, will tell you what google.com's IP address is in your area because it changes depending on where you are in the world. Google owns IP address, for example, 64.233.160.0, and a range all the way up to 644.233.191.255. That's a lot of, I of IP addresses, and they own all of them. And depending on where you are, you will get one of those maybe. They also own a bunch of other ranges. And Facebook, Google, Amazon, they also, they all do this. It's standard procedure to get a lot of different IP addresses so that people can access their network from outside of it very smoothly. Once your computer knows the IP you're looking for, data goes through those pops, through the NAPs, to TestTube's computer right here in our offices in San Francisco, and then we take over giving you the data directly to your computer that you want. Which is interesting, right? Because there's this guy, Al Gore, and you may have heard that he thought he invented all this stuff, that he created the internet. But that's not true. He didn't invent the internet, and he doesn't think he invented the internet either. He misspoke during an interview while seeking nomination for president in 2000. In a March 1999 interview on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, Al Gore was asked to describe what distinguishes him from his Democratic challenger, New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley. And his quote was, I've traveled to every part of this country during the last six years. During my service in the United States Congress, I took the initiative in creating the internet. I took the initiative in moving forward a whole range of initiatives that have proven to be important to our country's economic growth and environmental protection, improvements in our educational system. That was pretty clumsy wording, and it ended up giving all sorts of ammunition and all sorts of issues to his political enemies. Basically what he meant, though, was that the legislation he helped create or push through in Congress during his tenure broadened the scope of the internet in the United States, and that obviously worked. So while he didn't create the internet, thanks Al Gore, he did a good job so far. It's been going okay. The internet was actually created by numerous people. There's no single inventor. It became a Cold War weapon. It was suggested uh, if the Soviets attacked the United States, the telephones could go down, and all of these different sections of government would be unable to communicate. So they started a network of computers which could work independently using packet switching to get data from one place to another. Eventually, it started also as a university tool for professors and researchers, and they would be sharing their data. And it had four computers, as I mentioned earlier originally, and things started getting really messy. So in the 1970s, a guy invented TCP and then IP. TCP is Transmission Control Protocol, which is like a handshake between two computers. It says, hey, I'm going to talk to you now. This is my address. And the other computer says, cool, I'm going to talk to you now. Here's my address. And they can exchange information. And then there's IP, which is Internet Protocol. Today, you'll see this in your computer as the TCP IP section. Researchers all over the world used TCP IP connections to connect to each other's computers and share research and data and all sorts of great stuff into the 1980s, until in 1991, the network got large enough that Tim Berners-Lee announced the World Wide Web, where computers from all over the world could network with other computers from anywhere to anywhere. Super cool. And then in 1992, Mosaic was invented by college students at the University of Illinois. Mosaic was a web browser. It was a way to translate all of this information from the internet into something that we could better comprehend. That then became Netscape, which if you're as old as I am, you remember. And Netscape in 1998 launched a project called Mozilla, which started Firefox, which still exists today. You might even be using it to watch or listen to this show. Eventually, there were AOL disks in every mailbox. The internet was spreading everywhere that it could reach, and now even onto our phones. But how deep does this rabbit hole go? How big is the internet? And what mysterious hidden places are on the internet? All of this technology stuff is super fascinating, and if you love technology, you've most likely heard of our sponsor, that is Intel. 
They create breakthrough technologies that make amazing experiences possible. So we would like to thank them for sponsoring this episode of Test Tube Plus. We'd also like you to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. It is the best way to get amazing experiences like this podcast style show to you. See what I did there? Make sure you subscribe. Come back tomorrow for more Test Tube Plus, and we will see you then. Thank <laughs> you.